I've looked forward for a long time for this grand and glorious opportunity to come to, to this city to minister to these dear people. About in the early pioneer days when I sent Mr. Lindsay, I had on my heart Yakima, and I wound up in Spokane. So then again I sent to get to the Yakima and somehow got bypassed and went somewhere else. So tonight, this is a long wait, about 10 or 12 years, I've watched for the opportunity to come to the city. I am very happy for the opportunity also of getting this nice school here, named after our beloved President Dwight Eisenhower. And I trust that the Lord will give us an exceeding abundance above all that we could do or think this ten days of service. And we are wanting God, if it be his great plan, to save every lost person there is in this country around here on grounds to be saved. I truly believe that the coming of the Lord Jesus is nigh at hand. I believe that if we are living in the shadows of his coming, and I want to do all that I know how to get everyone ready for that grand event that's been prophesied and people has looked for it since his going away. And we see the conditions arising both in the political world and also in the military world and in the religious world, that all signs are pointing now that the coming is close at hand. We see the church in the minority, uh, spiritual believers, and we see the, all that he spoke of taking place. We know that waiting for us is bombs from anywhere in the world now. They don't have to look to the big nations. The little nations has the missiles to destroy the world at any time if they wish to. And now missiles are in the hands of sinful man. And every radar screen is set it waiting, waiting for one to come into their screen. And when they do, they'll turn theirs loose. What's going to happen when it all takes place like that? I'm so glad that I know the Lord Jesus is my Savior. I'm so happy for that. So happy that I know that there's many tens of thousands of others who feel the same as I do. They're waiting for that great time. We only know life as we know it as a human because that we've never been nothing but human. But when we're born again, there's a life that comes from above, that comes into us. I've had the privilege of traveling many nations, seeing many people. Altogether, I guess, many times it's put around the world. I've been pretty near every nation in the world, missionary. And I notice when I strike a nation, the strange thing is that that nation has a certain spirit. That spirit of that nation seems to be the, uh, like dominate the nation. We go to Germany, and it isn't like the spirit that's in Finland. We go to Finland, it isn't like the spirit that's in Australia. And you go to Australia, it's not like the spirit that's in Japan. And then you come back to America, it's got the American spirit. Everywhere you go, you find a different spirit. The people live different, act different. But one great thing I have noticed, if you take a German and send him to the United States, he'll soon take the spirit of the United States. Take an American, send him to Germany, he takes the spirit of Germany. But wherever and whatever nation you go to, when you find born-again Christians, they're all the same, no matter where it's at. And I've seen people that come into the meeting, like in... Our largest crowd that we ever had was 500,000 at Bombay. And then, I guess my greatest altar call we ever numbered was at Durban, South Africa. 30,000 one afternoon of heathen gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus when they seen something take place at the platform. 10,000 Mohammeds followed that. Now, but I've noticed, take the Bushmen and the tribesmen that come in that doesn't even know which is right and left hand. They wear no clothes. 
They don't know one word of English. They don't know any but just their tribal language. But when they receive the Holy Spirit, they act and do just the same things you do when you get the Holy Spirit. Just act the same way, go just exactly the same. It shows that God is universal. God is omnipresent, omnipotent, infinite, and he works the same with all these people. Every human being, regardless of color or what he is, how little, how big, what his color is, they're all of one blood. God made of all nations one blood. Germans, Swiss, Africans, everyone can give each other a blood transfusion. The color of our skin and the size of us has nothing to do with it, but every human being has got a little compartment in his heart that there's not even a blood cell in it. Many years ago, the critic used to say, God made such an awful mistake when he said, as a man thinketh in his heart, because there's no mental faculties in the heart for him to think with. But two years ago, I believe it was, when I was in Chicago in a meeting, uh, great headlines come in the paper that they have discovered, science has, that a man does have a mental faculty in his heart. That there's a little compartment in the heart, the human heart, that's not in the, the animal heart. They found it on research uh, on the heart. And in there, they say, it's the place where the soul abides. So then, after all, God was right when he said, as a man thinketh in his heart. Now, we, we reason with our mind, but the heart doesn't reason. The heart just believes. We look with our eyes, but we see with our heart. Do you look, you say, uh, something complicated, you say, I just don't see it. You, you mean you don't understand it. See, your understanding comes from your heart. You have your understanding. Now, many times, I know all Christians know this, that people will think, well, it just can't happen, but yet in my heart there's something tells me that it's going to happen. Did you ever have that experience, you Christians? Sure you have. That's that inside man thinking. It casts down reason. It doesn't have anything to do with the reason. Because with God, words should not be reasoned. We cannot reason out God. God is never known by science. Never is God known by, by mental powers. God is only known by faith. Knowledge will never get a man to God. Knowledge takes him away from God. That's where it started in the Garden of Eden. There were two trees. One was a tree of life, the other a tree of knowledge. Man took his first bite from the tree of knowledge. He separated himself from the tree of life. And every time he bites off the tree of knowledge, he continually gets farther away from the tree of life. Because he begins to think he knows how to reason it out. You cannot reason God. You've got to come back to the simple tree of life and abide under there eating the fruit of life. That's what we're here for, to bring the ministry that the Lord has given me to you people here at Yakima. And many of you attended meetings at other places. But for this city, perhaps be many years this week, it's never been in the meeting. Now, Many times people say, Brother Bram, you featured divine healing. No, that is wrong. I have featured Jesus Christ. See, uh, divine healing is a minor, and you can never major with a minor. And Christ is our main subject. Then we believe that Christ, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God, that he died for our sins, and rose again the third day, according to the Scripture, and now sits at the right hand of the majesty of God, being a high priest to make intercession upon our profession. We, we're waiting, expecting him to leave glory someday, to return to the earth, to resurrect the dead, and to translate those that are living into a glorified body, to be raptured in the sky, to live with him for the space of three and a half years, during the time of the tribulation period, and to return back to a purified earth to live a thousand years here on earth with his church and forever be with him. 
when he sits on the throne of David. Now, we're look, looking for that great time. Then our theme in the tabern in our services is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same. Now, we believe he's the same in every principle. Now, Hebrews 13, 8 is our theme. Don't forget that now during the meeting. If anything rises unseemingly, hold right with that scripture and take it back to the scripture. Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, we cannot deny the scriptures, for Jesus said, all scripture we know is given by inspiration. And heavens and earth will pass away, but not one scripture shall ever pass away, because it's God's word. Now, we believe that God can do things that he has not written in his word. But we like to stay just with what he has written, then we know we're sure. If you just stay with what he's written in the word. Now, during these ten days, if God permits us to go on, you may seem, see some things that will seem unreasonable to you, but if it seems a little question, in my speaking, I'll always stay right in the words on God's promise. That's enough for us. If we stay right with his promises, if God will confirm all of his promises, that's as good as we need, don't you think so? That's as good as we need of God to stay with his promise. Because I believe that we're living in a day that when there's mysterious things going on, and we'll continue to go on, and get complicated because we know that there's to be a Jambus and Jambus rise up in the last days to withstand Moses and Aaron, as the Bible says, and some impersonation to act like it's something that it isn't, but God's word is ever the truth. I always hold on to that. And that God's word is always eternally true, and no man's word or no man is any better than his word. If I don't keep my word, then I'm not much. And if God doesn't keep his word, he isn't God. But if God does keep his word, then he ever remains God. And in order to be God, he's got to keep his word. He's got to keep his word. And now, on these probably tonight, I'd like to speak to you a little while and kind of get acquainted with the auditorium, with the people, and kind of uh, get ready for the services to come. Now, I spoke a few moments ago that we did not uh, try to uh, major in divine healing, yet we teach that to be one of the Bible truths that Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgression. With his stripes, we were healed. Now, all redemptive blessings to us, the human race, was paid for for us at Calvary when Jesus died for us. We believe that the work and the complete uh, plan of God Every redemptive blessing was completed at Calvary, that all of God's promises was made possible to every human being that would accept it when Jesus died to clear the human before God at Calvary. I believe that every man in the world was saved when Jesus died at Calvary. Every sick person in the world was healed when Jesus died at Calvary. But now it's a finished work. Now the thing to do is can we get the people to see it and accept it? Therefore, divine healing doesn't lay upon some magic something that someone has in their hands or some holy oil or water that they sprinkle on the people. I do not believe in those things. I, I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient for everything we have need of. And I believe it's something that's already been paid for. Now, the initial and original way to receive any redemptive blessing is by hearing the Word of God, because faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word of God, like the ministers preach. If that were you and I, that would be sufficient. If the people didn't want to believe us, why, well, we'd just let them go on. But God is so good and so full of mercy. So after all that he sent his word, 
Then he set gifts into the church. We all believe that. First Corinthians 12, there is nine spiritual gifts in the church. That's an ever local body, or should be an ever local body. The gifts of healing, the gifts of uh, wisdom, the gifts of knowledge, and the gift of uh, all these other gifts is in the church. Nine different spiritual gifts is in every local body. Then God has gifts that he has foreknown for each age and has placed them into the church. Now we find out there's five of those gifts. The first of them is missionary or apostles. The word apostle means one cent. The word missionary means one cent. A missionary is sent, an apostle is sent. God sends his missionary, God sends his apostles. First is apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. Those five God-given gifts in the church. So each of you people who has a godly pastor has a gift from God in your church. A shepherd. Pastor means a shepherd to watch over the flock, to teach them the word of God. Then these other nine different spiritual gifts should be operating in the church to keep the church clean, like the Ananias and Sapphires and so forth. The Spirit of God rise up and call somebody out and tell them they're living wrong and, and rebuke that sin openly. And that's what the Holy Spirit is in the church for, to keep the church clean and ready for the coming of the Lord. We believe that. Now. Then there are these other gifts that come into the church. Then after the pastor, then there's evangelist comes in. And then there's teachers comes in. And then there's prophets come in. Then there's apostles come in. All these together, working together with the gift, keeps the church perfected and clean and ready for the coming of the Lord. And if this certain church age falls asleep, waiting on the Lord, the second church age falls asleep, even to the seventh watch, no matter how many ages fall asleep, they will all rise at the coming of the Lord and shall be caught up together with those that are alive and remain to meet the Lord in the air. And we're looking for that glorious day, and I believe that if God will help us before the week is over, uh, I believe that we will see clearer than ever before. I hope my eyes are open to a lot of things, too, because I'm here to learn like all of us are. I'm here to draw from you people something that to help me. Many people think that the evangelist doesn't need any help. You're mistaken. He needs more help than all the congregation does because he's standing between the enemy and the congregation. Now, being a stranger to you, I thought I would take and explain these things so that you would know that. We can start off and have a great meeting in this here area. And I believe and trust in God that after this service is over, that every church through the area will be packed out with fresh members and been converted and brought in. I trust that through that there will be an old-fashioned revival sweep this valley here that will cause people from all over the country to flow in here, seeking, though I find, when I come back to the United States, a hungry people after all the great meetings and things we've had across the nation. We've had great men across our nation, Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, and many of those great warriors of faith, great men, personal friends of mine. And I know they're good men, filled with God's Spirit, and wonderful teachers. And by myself, I'm more of an illiterate type of person. I'm not educated. I'm sorry for that. I did not get a schooling that I should get. I was raised in a poor family of ten children. And I was the oldest. I had to work to make a living for the family. But somehow God, in his great wise province, saw fit, way back before I knew anything about it, to put me a little place with you people. And to that I want to minister with all my heart to to be your brother, and I would not come here by no means in the world to cause any uh, uh, any tear up or any friction in the church, but I've come here to try to, to take the frictions away and bring the body of Christ together and let us know that we are all brethren, 
that we are all together. And when I come from my own Baptist church to, to minister amongst the Pentecostal people who believe the message that the angel of the Lord had brought me, and I found out that they were as bad as the Baptists, they had many different organizations of them, and I found great and fine brethren in every one of them. So I, I could not say tonight that I belong to the assemblies of the Church of God, and yet I do belong to them because I haven't just joined their ranks, but I was born in their ranks as a brother when I received the Holy Spirit. And I've tried to stand right in between the breach and say to both sides, don't argue, brethren. We are brothers. Let us love the Lord. And let's march forward. And united together. I'm a Kentuckian by birth, and all of you know what the emblem of Kentucky is, or slogan, is a crossed hand like this. Together we stand, and divided we'll fall. So we don't want the churches divided. We want to stand together. Though that we might disagree one with the other like that, that's just little, te- little things as technical. Let's believe the main principle. Jesus died to save us all. He's given us all the new birth, and we're waiting for his coming and enjoying the attributes of his death until he comes. That's all. We are enjoying divine healing, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus Christ is the same, God forgive me for making that statement of if he is, he, sacrilegious to say it, but he is the same yesterday, today, and forever because the Word says he is the same. Then, if he is the same, then how would he act if he was here on earth today? He would act just like he did yesterday if he is the same. You believe that on him? He would. Then if he had act the same, then he would do the same works that he did yesterday. Do you believe that? Now the scripture says, Jesus said himself in St. John 14, 7, He that heareth my work, no, the works that I do, and he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And the, the English translation there says, Greater than this shall he do, for I go to my Father. But if you'll take the original translation on that, it says, More shall he do. Now, no one could do greater than he did, because he raised the dead, stopped nature, and just done everything. But what it was, that he said, a little while, and the world will see me no more. Now, that word is cosmos, which means the world order. It shall see me no more. Yet ye, the church, shall see me, for I, and I is a personal pronoun, we know that, I will be with you. He's even said, in you, unto the end of the world. Now, what was it then? God could manifest himself through one man, a man, his son, called Jesus. Now, God takes the spirit of that Jesus and puts back into his children that's been adopted by Jesus Christ and manifests the same spirit and same power the world around. That's God in us. Emmanuel, in us, we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and I do believe in pure, absolutely Holy Ghost religion and holiness. I believe that a man cleaned up from a life of sin puts all of his drinking, lying, stealing, and everything else. I believe he lives for God, because the Spirit in him is God's Spirit. And that Spirit leads him and guides him into righteousness and holiness that God could live in him and will his, do his will in him. Now, there's the only one difference then would keep Jesus from being the same that walked on Galilee as to be here with us tonight and each one of us. I remember the Jesus I'm talking about is the third person, which is the Holy Spirit, which is in us, God in us. When the Son of God, God once lived in a pillar of fire, led the children of Israel. Then he came down and lived in a man, his own son, a creative body. Then he, then he was got a little closer to us. Then he had to sacrifice that body to break that virgin-born blood cell to cleanse the church that he might live in everybody's heart that would accept that blood for the cleansing process so that he could come into their heart by the Holy Spirit. Then that's God working in us. Now, 
The corporal body of Jesus cannot be here tonight. It might come. It would be a great hour, wouldn't it? If the corporal body of the Lord Jesus, which sits at the right hand of God tonight, if it should descend from heaven and come to the earth, we wouldn't need any more healing services or preaching services. It would all be over there. When will it come? I do not know. I don't believe anyone knows, because Jesus said they didn't. But he said when he seen such signs as we see today, know that the time was at the door. Now he promised the things that he would do, which I'll go into it later in the messages. A thought tonight on getting ready, just kind of feeling out the audience. We got ten nights, and many times people, if you don't, if you rush into something not knowing what you're doing, then the first thing you do, you find yourself all confused. But if you come into the line, know just exactly what to expect, then you know how to receive your healing. How that many times people on dealing with cancer, tumor, or some growth, malignant or not malignant, many times they fail to get their healing after they have already received it once. Now, a growth is a multiplication of cells. That's the same thing you are, a multiplication of cells. You know where your life comes from because it was through holy wedlock and we realize that the woman doesn't have the hemoglobin. It comes from the man, and, and the male produces the blood cell. Now, many of you people are farmers, and you have chickens, and you have look at the yard and see birds, and uh, the bird, a mother bird can build her nest and lay it full of eggs. And she can hover those eggs and treat them just as good as she can treat them and starve herself so she's so poor she can hardly get off the nest, turning those eggs reverently every few minutes. So if they'll hatch, keeping them warm, defying herself of all the food and things that she should have to build her own body, she's loyal to those eggs. But if that mother bird hasn't been with the male, then eggs will never hatch. They'll rot right in the nest. A hen, your chicken, can lay an egg. The hen can. She can set on the same way, and it'll never hatch unless she's been with the male bird. Now that's what I think about the church today. No matter how many members we have, how well we have to pet them and baby them, if they haven't been with the mate Jesus Christ and been born again, they can never believe divine healing or nothing else. You just got a nest full of rotten eggs. It's best to clean the nest and start all over again. Uh, if, if there ever was a time that they need a nest cleaning, it's in America right now. That's true. We have, by mistake, brought in many people and put them on the church book and so forth, which is fine. I'd rather they be in church and be out there on the street. But yet what we need is a revival. Now, a revival isn't so much to bring in new members, but revive that what you've already got in. See? Just like your, your sea over here. I was sitting over there by the shore the other day. They take me fishing yesterday after I had one day off, and I watched that great mighty sea churn those waves up and down. I thought, what are you so upset about? What you churn the waves about? I thought there's not one drop more water in it than when it is when it's perfectly calm. That's right. It's got the same amount of water. Not, no more water at all. But what you having that churning for, I thought, it's having a revival. What does it do? Shake all the trash out of water on the bank. So that's what, that's what the church needs today is a revival. <laughs> to get all the unbelief shuck out of us until we can... Be clean, don't you think so? For all what I mean by sin is unbelief. We realize that that's the only sin there is is unbelief. We believe that. He that believeth not condemned already. And I said one time, some time ago, preaching in a Methodist church, I said, smoking cigarettes, drinking whiskey, committing adultery, lying, stealing, that isn't sin. And a precious dear old sister sitting there with one of those little round collars on, talk, holding this all right. She said, I pray, tell me what he <laughs> I just got next to her. I said, sin is unbelief. You, you do those things because you believe not. He that believes on the Lord wouldn't do those things. He's passed from death into life. Jesus said in St. John 5, 24, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. And there's only one form of eternal life, and that's the Holy Spirit. See? He has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment, but hath, past tense, passed from death unto life. Oh, I like that, don't you? 
He that believeth, are we always the meaning produced the three classes of people, unbeliever, make-believer, and a believer. We have that in, we've always had it, and we, we always will have it. And so we want to get the, the unbeliever to be a believer and a make-believer to be a real believer. Why would we accept the substitute when the skies are full of the real? Why do we want something that's so fictitious and all something, uh, a bunch of emotion or whatever it is? Now, remember, I believe that the Holy Spirit has plenty of emotion. Anything I can prove to you, anything that isn't, hasn't got life in it is dead. So if the church hasn't got a little life, there's something wrong with the church. It needs a resurrection. So I believe we have to have emotion. We got, I see we're on a basketball floor. Now, uh, many of you people, children here, go to school. Now, I sure thank God for this beautiful school. It's the most beautiful school I was ever in, I think, in the auditoriums I've been in many. But uh, here, what if you had a basketball game here and your team was a winning all my, you just sat there in a the balcony. You said it's the deadest game I ever attended. <laughs> well, sure. Well, if our masters are winning the fight, I tell you, it, 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 we can sure do a little cutting up once in a while. You know, let him know that we, we appreciate the victory that he's given. That's right. So we don't want it to be a dead meeting, a dead church. We want it alive with the Spirit of God moving in a real, sensible, sane, gospel way, just performing great signs and wonders and showing the signs of the Messiah in our midst. As Israel journeyed from the from Egypt to the Promised Land, when they were on their journey, little did Balaam know that there was a, the voice of a king in the camp. He forgot to see that smitten rock and that brass serpent and the, the triumph shout of the king. That's what we want tonight. We got a smitten rock in the camp. Do you believe that? That's the rock Christ Jesus. He was smitten like the rock was in the wilderness by the judgment stick of God. And he bore our judgment that as uh, that perishing people was rejuvenated again and given new life from that water that come from the rock, so is the church each time it speaks to the rock it gets new water flowing, new life, and revived again. Then he had a brass serpent making atonement for all their sins that they did. A water is a separation laid up without the camp to separate the unbeliever from his unbelief. They had all of that. And then in the midst of all of it, there was a triumph shout of the king in the camp all the time. So we're on our journey tonight, and let's serve the Lord with all of our hearts. Now, we'll try each night to let you out. Well, I think we begin tonight at about 8.30, and maybe tomorrow night we'll start a little earlier. And then tomorrow night I want to go more into a subject with you on divine healing so that you'll thoroughly understand. One little thing I want to push in right here where if I forget it tomorrow night. Let's take, for instance, a, a growth, a tumor, cancer, whatever it is. How did it start? Like my hand here, there's nothing on my hand now. Someday there might be a growth, cancer, whatever it might be, tumor. What is that growth? It's somewhere there's another little germ gets in there and begins to develop cells, and it's a multiplication of cells, just like you start in the womb of mother begin to grow into a uh, human being. Dog comes into a dog, chicken to a chicken, and so forth. But a tumor, cancer, or any of those growths, they don't have any certain form because they have, they're not made in any image of human being. Some of them got legs, and some of them round like pancakes, and some loblong more. What is it? It's demons. Jesus called them devils. Was he right? Certainly he was right. Because the word devil means a tormentor. Cancer, tumor, and diseases that torment you. Now the last commission Jesus gave to his church was go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devil. You believe that? Cast out devil. Then what happens if the life left that tumor? We'll call it a tumor or cancer. It's the greatest killer. Now, if the life leaves that cancer, immediately, what happens when the life leaves you? For the first 
day or so, your body shrinks. How many hunters is there in here? Hunts deer and animals, all right? Now, you kill a deer today, and you say, or a butcher, or whatever you want to be, even an undertaker, see? You say, this body laid on the scale, it weighs uh, 250 pounds. Be careful what you tell the boys. Now, when you weigh it in the morning, it'll be pounds lighter. You know that, don't you? It'll shrink a great percent overnight. The human body does the same. Any body of cells does the same because it's drying out. Now, then let it lay there for just about three or four days in the sun. Then pick it up. Let a little dog get run over on the street. Let him lay there for three or four days in that hot sun. Watch what happens. He'll be twice his size almost. Then he's heavier than he ever was. Now, like a man, when this spirit, see, we're not dealing with that growth. That's what the doctor deals with. The doctor deals with what he can feel or what he can see. Two of his five senses he can work with. That is, his feeling or his seeing. Now, he feels the growth. He operates. He looks at it. Takes it out. Now, if there's a piece of root left, it just keeps on growing. Now, we don't deal with that growth at all in divine healing. We deal with the life that's in that growth, the devil itself, that life. Then when that life comes out, immediately, a few hours, the patient begins to get relieved, feeling fine, go testifying. Usually after about three or four days, I'm gone from the city. Well, then the Bible says that when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks in dry places. He brings back seven devils worse than he was. And if the good man of the house isn't there to protect, that demon will come right in again, and the last estate of that man would be eight times what it was at the beginning. See? He'd have seven more different things. Now, we've got to believe that because God said that, and that's his word. We just have to work our message from that. See? And that's true because it's God's word. Now, if the people run right in, maybe having three nights meeting, People run right in and get prayed for. Oh, I got healed. I feel so much better. Got up off of a cot, walked home. About three, or four, about seventy-two hours, corruption sets in, and mortification begins to swell. And say, Oh, I lost my healing. Oh, I, I lost my healing. That's the best sign in the world. You got your healing. See, that's the sign you got it, not lost it. And little simple things like that that the church has to be taught. See, to know how to take a hold. Don't you let no unbelieving. As soon as you say, oh, I lost it, that quick Satan returns again. That's right. And then you're worse than you ever were. See, and that's the reason my meetings has never had ample time where I could explain it and get in among the people and tell them about it. And some of these days, the Lord's willing, I'm going to get a big tent and move out somewhere where I can stay three or four weeks at a time to five. Just keep, let that patient return back again and prove to him and show him that the thing is gone. Because God's no respect to person. He that'll heal one man with a cancer will heal the other man with a cancer if he comes in the same attitude on the same basis. Because would you take your children and sit down at the table and each one of them hungry and say, now you can have a glass of milk to keep you from dying. But you, John, you can't have it. Joe can have it. You wouldn't do that. You think as much of John as you do of Joe if you're a right parent. Well, if you know how to good give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to his children? So see, every one of us can be healed. And I've seen so much done, I tell you, friends, I've, I just know God can do everything. I've seen lepers in this last stage here. I've seen people that were, I've got doctor's statements of people have been laying dead, examined by the doctors, dead, come back to life again, by faith, just believing it. See? And a little mother stand over a baby and see that baby return back to life after being died that morning at 9 o'clock, this is printer 1030 that night, just recently down in Mexico. I said, don't call that. That's a doctor sign that. See, so when we make a statement, it has to be backed up. See? That is true. We don't let it be published because I, I, you know what I mean, big things? Because, the, you know, we American people are looking for big things. Big things. A lot of noise to it. <laughs> see? Oh, a lot of Hollywood. God help us to get away from that and get back to the gospel. Right. I'm so sick and tired of Hollywood evangelism and seeing millions dying out there without knowing Christ at all. See, it, it certainly is sick. How contrary that is to God. Elijah, the rushing wind didn't attract him, the noise of the thunder didn't attract him, the earthquake didn't attract him, but when he heard a still, small voice, 
Then the prophet veiled his face and walked out. That's what attracted his attention. And brother, sister, let's listen this week to that still, small voice. Now, before we approach his word to read it, let us bow our head just a moment to pray. Now, Father God, we are approaching thy word in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because that you promised if we would ask anything in his name, we would receive it. And we are sure that your word is true because we have come to this gracious little city that's invited us here and all these fine servants of yours gathered out here and these precious minister brothers back here behind me to pray, watching over their flock out here, loyal shepherds. How I thank you for that, Father. And many sick sheep are waiting for the hour for you to deliver them. They can't go on any farther, Lord. The doctors laid many of them back, perhaps, that their heart's too bad to work anymore. The cancer's going to kill them. And the doctor's done all he knows how to do. We're grateful for him and the knowledge that you've given. But now, Father, there's yet another step we can make. That's why we're here. Some of them are here with sin sick souls. They do not know the joy of serving you, Lord, and knowing you as a personal friend that walks with you on the street, rides with you in the car, talks to you in the secret closet, eats with you at the table. Oh, God, let Jesus become a personal friend, just one member of the family in every home that's here in this city. Throughout the region. Grant it, Lord. We pray now that you will bless our feeble efforts as we try to place before our precious friends the gospel. And Lord, will you help me? I'm the one that needs help. And if I should say anything or try to say anything that was contrary to your will or word, then, Father, you're still the same God that could close the lines now in the den with Daniel. You can close mine also. And I pray that you'll not let me say one thing but what would be to the edifying and to, of your church and of your people. And may every sick person be healed. May every lost person be saved. Every backslider brought back to fellowship again. Bless your word as we read it tonight for this little text. May it put a preparation together for a a real time in these next few nights in your service. When services is closed, then we'll humbly bow our heads and hearts before you and give you all the praise and glory, for we ask it in the name of your dear and beloved child, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now to you who are usually keep texts or count other texts or places, I want you to turn tonight to 1 John, the 5th chapter, and the 4th verse, just to read a few words on a little text to draw context. And while you're turning, I might say that now on the evenings that we are praying for the sake, in order to keep order, the boys will be down here about an hour before service starts, giving out prayer cards to anybody that wants them. They take the prayer cards and bring them up before the people, mix the prayer cards all up, bring them down and give them to anybody that wants them, and the prayer cards are to be used that night. Don't, don't uh, uh, bring them or give them to anyone else. You, you, we've heard the instructions. You're the one that gets the prayer card. Then if you have some friend that wants the prayer card, then have them come over and hear the instructions that Mr. Borders and them will be giving you instructions and ministers and so forth. And the prayer cards are inexchangeable, should be given to each one, and then they'll call by numbers to come to the platform. Then that makes it so that no one knows where the prayer line is going to start. No one knows what cards they give me, prayer card number one. Well, if you had number one, we may start from 15. Because I've tried this. We tried it without prayer cards. You'd talk about a scramble. This really would be an arena. And then we have a... And then we tried that. Then I tried sending a hundred prayer cards to each cooperating pastor. And then the first pastor got his group in. The rest of them didn't get them in. 
while the meeting was going on, because the time we got through that, and them slow-moving lines, because we don't let them pass by until we are sure that everything's all right. So I think that's where you'd want it. Is that right? And then, and then uh, many times there's 50 healed in the pla- out there when there's one healed on the platform. So it doesn't matter about that too much. And the Holy Spirit goes right on out to the audience, but we'll get to it farther on. It healed just the same. But the card, then you see, then what we did, we couldn't do that because the first pastor got his in, about a hundred cards for three nights meeting, that settled. Then the next we did then, I'd go down and give out prayer cards and I'd come to, I'd say, let the, like this little boy here, let him come count. And where he stops, we'll start from there. Believe it or not, Mommy had Junior stop out on her cards, you know. So uh, we're still human, we realize that. And we had complaints about that. Then I had one fellow that was caught in my meeting selling those prayer cards, guaranteeing someone that they get in the prayer line. One night, finished that man. So I got my own son to give out prayer cards. And I know that that wouldn't be with him. And then I fixed it so the people would know that he wouldn't know where the prayer line was going to start. And he brings the prayer cards before the people and mixes them all up and just hands them out to you wherever you want them. So he doesn't know himself. Nobody else knows, and then, then when I come to the meeting, I leave it just wherever the Holy Spirit. I've done a lot of times count how many in this row and take this row away from it, divide it by that row, and so forth like that, or just wherever the Holy Spirit would lead me to start. That's where we start. Then we, before the service is in, though, we always pray for everyone that comes to the meeting. We always get that. And then we will let you to know too. We don't try to say now the evangelist is here; he's the one going to do the healing. We let you know that your pastor is a man of God, just as much of authority to pray for sick as me or anybody else. Me, or Roberts, or Tommy Osborne, or any, any of the men that's on the field today praying for the sick. Your pastor has the same authority. He might not operate under the same gift, but he's still God's servant operating under the gift that God gave him. So we always remember that. And now you come about, uh, what time do you go to the beginning of the church? 7.30, and you ought to be here at 6.30, so we, they won't interfere with the rest of me. You start in to give up the cards up to that time, so come as early as you can so they won't all be gone when you get here. And then each night they'll be giving out cards that we pray for the sick, and that keeps the big rush down and everybody, and then they climb over one another. Oh, my. You ought to see in foreign lands where we, you have to take a militia almost. I see them run over a, a group of five and bank soldiers see a woman jump up on top of a man's shoulders and run right across, getting across that man's shoulders, upset the whole army rank, something like that, running between their legs, maybe four or five thousand of them at the time, and make a rush like that and just break on through anyhow. Tear the clothes off for her and everything else, just trying to touch her or something. So we have here, we can have order in small meetings like we have now and have it done decently and in order. Don't you believe in that? Amen. All right, now as we read the fifth chapter and the fourth verse of uh, First John. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Lord, add his blessings to the reading of his word. Now, I want to speak tonight upon the subject of what it takes to overcome all unbelief our faith. Now, we are just closing yesterday where we had two great campaigns here in the United States. One was a, a Democrat. They had theirs in California, and the papers was all full of it. You couldn't turn the radio on without hearing it. That's all right. That's a party. And they uh, chose what they thought to be the best men for their party. And uh, they chose Mr. Kennedy. And then when they uh, elected Mr. Kennedy in their rally, and all they built the platform for Mr. Kennedy to be the greatest man in the world today. And then when they finally elected the man that they wanted elected, they all cheered and gave great uh, praises to Mr. Kennedy. And yesterday or day before, whenever it was, when the other party, the Republican Party, chose Mr. Nixon. Well, they preached for several days building a platform for Mr. Nixon and on their campaign. And they uh, 
Finally, when the party elected the man that they thought that they wanted to run for the presidency of our beloved United States, the crowd cheered and joyed and screamed and jumped up and down because they had elected the man that they come in that campaign to elect. Now, we come here tonight to elect a man. That man is the Lord Jesus. And I'm trying to build a platform for him tonight, that in the coming nights of this campaign that we might rejoice and praise his name because that we have elected him in our hearts to be our Savior, our God, our healer. And first we want to place a platform for him. And now we're going to talk about faith and victory. And there has been many great victories won in this world. There, if I could enumerate them tonight, it would go in the multiplied thousands of the great victories that's been won around the world, ancient days of Rome and Greek and so forth, and the great warriors that has won great victories until the whole earth is bathed with blood of martyrs. I might call your attention to two or three just to get started, and how they act when that victory has been won. For instance, when uh, the Germans in the last or the first Second World War it was that won the victory in France, and after they had made everything safe. They made the platform for Hitler, and Hitler stood there, they said, at the Ark of Triumph. I stood there many times myself. And when he stood there, that tens of thousands of thousands of Germans marched by with the goose step, with the German salute to their fury as he stood on his platform that they had built for him, and he said, the sky like a cloud. For a half hour, a German-built airplane coming over. People screamed, guns fired, whistles blowed, bells rang, everything because they had won the victory and had taken Paris, taken France. And years some time ago at the World's Conference, the Pentecostal World's Conference in London, England, they were showing a film there of the... Uh, uh, Stalin, when they brought him in when Germany fell and they brought him into Berlin. What a sight that was to watch those German, uh, Russian built tanks with the Turk guns just a little over one another's head, so perfectly trained for just one solid fire went around. Oh, I don't see how the world could exist under such terrific shock as they went into Germany. How do them guns just level a little over one another and it's a panoramic just constantly firing with those great big explosive balls of shrapnel that just tore Germany to pieces. And when they finally had surrendered and they went in, they made it safe and brought a platform and brought Stalling over in a plane when he landed. That Russians with that kind of a little funny stoop down and up. Tens of thousands, times thousands of Russian soldiers went in, stooping and back and forth and hoorahing and screaming and shouting and going on because that they had won the victory over Germany, had beat them down. And it was something similar the day that the peace was signed when we had dropped an atomic bomb over Hiroshima and blowed about a million people into bits and burnt an old gang out to their stomach and eyeballs fell out, and then Japan surrendered. And when it did, the whistles blowed and guns fired and screams went off and everything, and many fathers were glad that the war was over because it, they'd get a little rest. Many fathers and mothers were glad because their son would come home again. And it was, a, it was a great day. And anything that wins a victory, it's an overcoming something. It overcomes their object that they're fighting against. 
I've stood in the jungles in South Africa while lion hunting, and here's a lion that I used to think was an old mangy scavenger, but I had a respect for him because of all his great killing power. He only kills to eat. The beast can run over him all day long. After he's done eating, you won't pay any attention to him. But when he kills something, it's a pathetic thing to watch him. He'll kill the, the vulture beast or the zebra or something. He'll put his feet up on it. And he'll throw his big master's head up in the air and the shaggy mane around his neck and he'll roar. Oh, I've stood off 500 yards and see little pebbles drop off the ground, off the hill and roll down from that terrific blast of that victorious cry that he gives. He found something to eat and he puts his feet up on it, licks it in, roars in the jungles. All these things doesn't last. These wars and bloodshed, it comes right back again because it's won in the wrong way. It cannot last. There will be no peace until Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. Then the world will study war no more. But until then, the nations are controlled by the devil. As the Bible says they are, and they'll war one against another until Jesus comes. I was that day when Satan took him on the high mountain and said, If thou be the Son of God, fall down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. They're all mine. I'll do with them whatever I want to. I'll give them to you if you just worship me. Jesus, knowing that he had fall heir to him in the millennium, he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And Satan got in the back of him. There is an old proverb that's more than a proverb. No matter how, who is there first, you have to play the rules of the game or you'll never win. If a runner is running around the track and one takes a short cut and cuts to the field and beats the other in there by half hour, Still, he'll be disqualified at the end of the race. Yes. He's got to play it according to the rules of the game or he's disqualified. And that's the way we have to do the race of life that we're running now. It has to be played according to God's qualifications or we'll lose when we get there. Whether we are president, whether we are the governor or a minister or what church we belong to or what denomination. The rules of the game has to be kept. We must run it fair. We must play it with the rules. We must preach the word. We must do it. We're in a race. Paul said in, I believe in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, that seeing we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that easily beset us that we might run with patience the race that's set before us. Paul was speaking in the Olympics and so forth. That was in Greece and Rome and so forth. He knows that you had to play that game fair. Or if you did not, you'd be disqualified. And tonight, as born-again Christians, as believers here at the end time, we've got to play the game according to the rules. We've got to run with patience the race that's set before us, looking to the author and finisher, Jesus Christ. Right after that, or before that, previous to that, he gave the great 11th chapter of Hebrews, which gives the heroes of faith, by faith Moses, by faith Abraham, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, all the great heroes of faith, and saying, seeing that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, the unbelief, that does so easily beset us. Here we are tonight, right in the shadows of the coming of the Son of God. And yet we find the church in anemic condition. We ought to be great, strong, mighty warriors of faith that would shake a nation. God gives it to us. We would just receive it. So there's those things upon us that hold us back from running. Let's lay aside all those little weights now. Because we're looking to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Who was made man on earth and dwelt among us and was made sin, that through his righteousness we might be forgiven of our sins? 
You became us sinners that we might become his righteousness. And otherwise, like this, he become me that I might become him. He was the son of God, I was a sinner. He taken my place to become a sinner that I might be a son of God. And when we see that, it ought to attract the attention of every man and woman to lay aside every little skeptic talk. Oh, I love that. Lay aside every weight and the little unbelief that does so easily beset us. Some little something come up and we say, well, I never heard of that before. Search it out in the scripture. If it's the Bible, stay with it. You people here are noted for your apples. Great delicious apples raised in the valley here and other fruits. When you set that little tree out no larger than that, just a little slip, every apple that's ever be in that tree is in it right then. Certainly it is. If it doesn't, where does it come from? It's in the tree. And you plant the tree in the ground. You irrigate it, put water on it. What does that little tree do? It grows and why how it grows, it drinks and draws from the earth water. It draws more than its potion, more than enough to fill it. It draws it so much until it pushes out limbs, branches, apples, then goes down and hides through the winter time, keeps the sap from being killed in the tree. What intelligence runs it down into the ground, hides it through the winter? Put a water in a tin cup and set it on a fence and see if it'll go down when winter time comes. Certainly it won't. Some intelligent runs it down. That same intelligent that runs the water in there is the same spirit of God that's brought us together for this convention. The same spirit that's bringing us together here under the heavenly places in Christ Jesus to find his goodness and mercy for the hours that lays ahead of us. Oh, he's real God is. Now we find that in this little tree, it pushes out. When it grows, it pushes out. And when you are born into the kingdom of God, just a little baby in Christ, everything that you have need of in this life's journey is in you when you receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, then what you have to do is drink and drink and keep on drinking. Don't just stop when you join church and are baptized. Just keep drinking till you have faith for this and faith for that and faith for this and push out until all the manifestations of the Holy Spirit is living in the church. Then a reward of those that diligently seek it. Now, how are we planted? We're planted in Christ Jesus. Now, I believe, this is my estimation of him, he's the inexhaustible fountain of life, that you cannot exhaust his goodness. Some people think, well, I hate to call on God so much. That's what he wants you to do. You have not because you ask not. You ask not because you believe not. Ask abundantly that your joys might be full. That's what God wants. Ask big things. I'm asking for hundreds of souls in this meeting. I'm asking that every sick person enters that door will go out of here well. I'm believing it. I'm believing that after we go that this won't be another gathering together, but it'll be a revival in Yakima here. Satan's cut me out of it long enough, and I'll be I'll reach here for a real sweeping revival in every church and around the country. Went out this afternoon, went to the different places, this and amongst the people. An old straw hat on, pulled that over my face and so forth. Now, just to see the attitude of the people. You got fine people here. You got something to work on. Right. Now, what we got to do is get to work. We're here tonight to elect our Lord Jesus as our king in our heart, our governor, our faith giver. Our God, our healer, our Savior, elect Him in our heart. Go out here now and candidate for this great election that's coming at the judgment when He'll be crowned King of kings and Lord of Lords. Now, we're living in a terrific day, but all that you have need of is already supplied to you when you believe. So many people that they find, when they join church here, especially in America, they just become drifters. They just, well, they God, I brother Branham and I, I got saved and I put my name on the book and I, that's about all I've done. Just drifting. We don't want to do that. You never got saved just to be a member of a church. You got saved to work. We don't dress an army up just to lay around on the corner and flirt with the girls with pretty uniforms on. We train an army to fight. And we're not at a picnic. We're on the battleground. 
We're out here facing the enemy of our Lord Jesus and the enemy of our souls. Let us be up and doing with a heart for any stripes. I like that psalm of life. Be not like dumb green cattle. Have to drive me in a little crowd somewhere over this way and down this way. Let's be a hero. Times of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime with partings leave behind us footprints on the face of time. Footprints that perhaps another while sailing over life's solemn main for a forlong and shipwrecked wreck, brother in seeing our footprints that shall take part again. Let us do something. We're written epistle. Now, here's some time ago, a few years ago, my wife, I was in the study, she came out the door and she said, Billy, there's a, there's a bum at the door. He wants something to eat. I said, feed him. Give him something. If he's a man, I don't care what he is, feed him. Divide what we got with him. Man's hungry. She said, I'm afraid of him. I said, oh, my open the door trying to get something to eat. Pick him something get it to him. So she fixed it on the table and called him in, and she come in the room. So I was just a little afraid of him because he's kind of dirty looking. And I went out and I said, how do you do, my good man? He said, how do you do? And he was eating his dinner, and, and so I said, um, where are you from? He said, oh, just here and there. I said, where are you going? He said, oh, same thing, just here and there. I said, what purpose do you have in life? He said, none. Well, that's just about the way that, that people get to do. We've got to have something that we got a purpose for. We've got the purpose in our heart. We've got to do something. Now, if you say, oh, we're having a revival. Yeah, we're over the hiding hours and lost orders. Don't let that be you, just a floater or a drifter. You can never mount anything like that. Let's get up and do something about it. Let's put our shoulder to the wheel. Let's see our church prosper. Let's get the kingdom prosper. Let's see if the sick gets in here. Let's see that God is laid down among the people and great signs and wonders take place that will strike the nation. I'm satisfied that there'll be things happen here that'll thrill this country, that'll shake it for the kingdom of God. If each one of us will get behind us. What are we doing? Building a platform for our Lord. We want to bring him to the Catholic. We want to bring him to the great revival. And we've got to elect him in our own hearts. We've got to purpose something, get something to do with it, something to do for her. some purpose. You don't just all join the church and drift on. You don't do it that way. You always, you've got to have a purpose in what you're doing. Wife well, say, well, I'm just a wife. Go on the telephone. Do something. Do something to help the Lord Jesus now. Now, there is a time that a man can come to a place where he can have a purpose. It's something that'll change you. And that is when a man meets God. A man can never be the same if he ever meets God. Face to face, it'll change him in spite of anything you can do about it. A man can never be the same as he once meets God. Now that's true. Let us take somebody. That was Noah. Noah had no certain purpose in life. He was a common farmer out in the field, and one day God met him. And he spoke to him and told him something that was impossible to ever happen would take place. Then from that hour on, why Noah purposed in his heart that he'd fill that ark regardless of what all the fanatics said. Why it never rained from the heavens. They never had even moisture upon the earth. It was irrigated from spring. There never been a cloud in the sky. How was he going to do it? Well, God said it was going to happen. And Noah purposed in his heart to achieve this something for God, and he did it. No matter how much they laughed at him or how much they said this, that, or the other, how is it going to rain? Where's the rain at, Noah? I don't know. Show me where the rain is. I can't show you, but when the time comes, the rain will be there. Yeah. Right. That's God. And when your doctor turns you down and says, cancer's going to kill you, how in the world are you going to live? I can't tell you how it's going to be, but God send the pair of sick, and it'll be there. Right. Someone said to me not long ago, I was preaching on Elijah in the crow's feeding. 
I made a little rude statement. Sorry, people, excuse me for this. But I said, he's a lot better off. They said he was crazy up there on that tree. He had colored servants to serve him every day. When he wanted water, he just got to get a drink. When come time for a meal, a colored servant, a crow, I brought him a sandwich. And a minister of a certain church said to me, you don't actually believe it goes for sandwiches. I said, I certainly do. The Bible said it was meat and bread. And I believe it. I said, I want to ask you something. Where did he get it? Where did those crows get it? I said, that wasn't up to Elijah to figure all that out. He just told, God told him he'd feed him the crows for it, and he'd eat it, and he's satisfied with it, and that's all he counted. That's the way it is about divine healing, or the power of God. No matter who tries to explain it and show it away, God said it would be so, and it'll be there. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His power is just the same. He said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, so he ought to do also. How are you going to do this? I can't tell you, but God said it would happen, and it just takes place, that's all right. I can't explain how that cow can eat green grass and give white milk, but I drink it all the time, just the same. I don't know the mechanics of it, but the only thing I know is milk and I drink it. That's the way somebody said, oh, you get them people worked up. They're all excited. That's how I don't know about that. I can't tell you what kind of excitement is. I know that something changed my life when that excitement got on me. Someone said, you go crazy. I said, leave me alone. I'm more happier like this than was the other way. So I got salvation this way. I hope I'm so excited till I die because I'm having a wonderful time believing God's Word and seeing confirm it with everything that He has promised me. There to our Lord is. That's that great one. Sure, we believe. Oh, when God meets a man, He changed. When Noah met God, His whole achievement was to build that ark. People come out, what are you doing, Noah? It's an ark. What is an ark? It's a boat. What's a boat? It's the thing that's coming in water. It'll fall down out of the heavens and God's going to destroy this whole wicked world. And all that don't come in this ark is going to, go to be perished. Oh, say, you're taking back to a psychiatrist. There's something wrong in the old man's head. Well, what was it? He believed God. And a man that believes God acts foolish to the world because it pleased God to the foolishness of preaching. Hey, man. All that the exalting in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Blessed are you when man shall revile you and make all manners of fun to you and call you all manners of names for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly like glad because they persecute the prostitution before you. It's always been that. When you get the spirit of the nation, you're on, you become an American. That's a good national spirit to have. But sometimes, from the way things are going now, it's getting pretty bad. I was San Angelo just recently at Rome. And a big sign before you went to the and it said, to the American women, please put on clothes in honor of the dead before you come. I think that's pretty bad. Great leader of a certain nation asked me to get through said, have you all got any good women over your country? I said, thousands of them. Well, what's the thing? All them dirty songs about them. Every song comes over here something dirty about the women. I said, that's just the other side. You don't know the good side of it. You read the blank page. But I said, we sure we got born again Christian women that's loyal and real ladies. You're old. Real. You're the kingdom people. In fact, I said, so I'm your nation to tell you that. Right. See, when you get a spirit. Here some time ago, I was going to the store. Uh, a wife and I, and there were some ladies who wanted to put their immoral clothes on. And, and I, we didn't see about one woman out of about 7,000 that had on any other kind of clothes. And, and my wife said, he says, that, Billy, what is it? Is it uh, that uh, them women all... Dressed like that, and I said, Oh, that's just American spirit. <laughs> What's that, aren't we Americans? I said, Yes, we are Americans. That's right. It's the greatest nation in the world. We love it. But yet, we're not exactly Americans. I said, What are we? I said, We're heaven born. I said, When we come up there, now, if you just, uh, are just Americans, you can dress like the rest of them and go out on the same drift, go right along with us. But when your spirit comes from up there, it's holy. Oh. Hallelujah. It's different. Make you act like you do up there. That's right. So when you receive that spirit, you become odd to these people here. See, you look different. You act different. And that's what Noah did. He had folks of God and had been changed. He a floater. In the Andalusian world, he become a creature of God that had been born into the kingdom to bring a message. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Radical religion, right? 
people's living holy and claiming there's something coming from above. And we believe not water, but the water of life falls every night. From above, from the fountain that still is left on the coming uh, manual, singing for sinners. Lose <laughs> all their guilty stains. Power and glory flows out of that fountain up there to his church. When he died and rose on Easter morning, he cut a hole all the way through the skies of glory. To let the glory fall down on his church that come on the day of Pentecost. It's falling ever since. We believe that with all of our hearts. Now, notice as we're placing his platform, let's take another man first. That was Abraham. He's just an ordinary man. He came down with his father from up at Babylon and Shinehire down in the valley and lived there in the city of Ur in the land of Chaldees. And the first thing you know, maybe he was a, oh, a field man or a sheep herder or something. And one day he was out in the field when he was 75 years old. His wife there was 65. And God met Abraham and told him of another land that was far beyond that. And he told him he was going to have a baby by Sarah. And she was past the age of barren and had been in the all of her life. And all and he was too. But what was going to take place? God was going to perform something. And that man for year after year, as long as he lived, he professed that he was a pilgrim and a stranger looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Hey, man, it changes a man when he hears God speak to him. Oh, listen this week. Listen for the voice of God to speak to you. It'll change you. It'll take all the doubt out of your mind, knowing that our Jesus is the same yesterday and forever. When we see him come into the meetings, begin to do the same things that he did when he was here on earth, then you want to listen close to that little voice. That's something that'll change you. Say, yes, God, that's exactly what the Scripture says. That's word by word what the Scripture says. Go home, take your Bible, read it out, see if it's right. Search through the Scripture. It has to come from Genesis to Revelation. Tie through the Bible. That's exactly your promise. And hear God. It'll change you. It'll give you faith to believe. Them crippled hands will come loose. Those legs will come loose. That cancer will vanish away. Those blind eyes will open. And the things that God's promise will be made manifest. We're in a world who has been weaned away from those things. But we're building a platform tonight for a man. Amen. Amen. As the woman said at the well, come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? Yes. Come see the man, the man that we're building on tonight, Lord Jesus. Upon him, for upon all other grounds of sinking sand, all other grounds will perish. But that rock Christ Jesus will stand forever. You believe that? Yeah. Abraham confessed that he was a pilgrim and a stranger. All the days of his life, he looked for that city whose builder and maker was God. Always that way, Moses had drifted away from Egypt and it got out in the wilderness. He was living fine. He was living back behind the mountain. Lovely wife, a little boy, Gershom, the fall heir to all Jezreel's sheep. Well, he was all right. He was going just drifting along with the eases of tide. He was down there in trouble, crying, and God had elected him to deliver the people. But he got away from it. Now, that's what's the matter with many of our churches today. God called us to a ministry. God called us to be His people. God called us to believe in signs and wonders. God called us to perform signs and wonders. He called us to do that. And we're 50 too far away from it. What we need is another visitation of God. Oh, God, send it here at this Eisenhower Auditorium. Send the visitation of the Spirit of God. We're 50 too far away like Moses is. Moses is all right back there. He's having a good living. The church today's got bigger buildings than ever had, better churches, better dressed people, better living people than ever had. But, oh, brother, that's not the thing. Those things perish. We got the victory. We got the fight. We got to do something for the kingdom of God. There was Moses back there living luxuriously, walking down one morning, and God spoke to him out of that burning bush. That man was changed from that time on. What a radical thing it causes you to do when you find God. Look at Moses. Run, killed one Egyptian, and run from it out into the desert. And here he was the next morning after he had met God in this burning bush, had his wife sat in the straddle of a mule with that little gushing on her hip like that, whiskers hanging about that low with a stick in his hand, going down there, hopping along, shouting and praising God, leading this old mule with his wife on it. Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt to take over. <laughs> A one-man invasion. <laughs> but he done it. 
He did it because God said so. And he had faith. When God speaks to a man, he has faith and he has ambition. And he has a purpose. When God speaks to a man, he gives him a purpose. When God speaks to a man, he gives him ambition. When God speaks to a man, he gives him faith to do it. To accomplish or achieve what his purpose in life is. What God's called him to do. He's called us to be the church of God. Amen. Let's, let's uh, make it a purpose in life to see that we are the church of God. Let's have ambition. Not to sit around because the Jones is one of the, or the free capers want. Why do we care about the free capers? If they don't do it, let's us do it anyhow. Amen. The rest of the nation wants to sink. That's up to them. And that come all, we stand for God. We want God. We want to achieve. We want to have faith. We want to have ambition. Let's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For he said, all things are possible for them that believe. Surely I say unto you, not if I, but if you shall say to this mountain, be moved, and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you've said shall come to pass, you can have what you've said. I believe that with all my heart. You believe that? He had an ambition. He never was the same after that. He had an ambition. He had something to work forward to. And he had faith to do it. All the days of his life, he served God to deliver those people. He wasn't concerned about, as long as he's getting along all right, why did he care about those people laying down there suffering? And God says, I've heard the cries of my people, and I remember my promise with that, with Abraham. And today, when the church is sick, the sickness is piled up, and the people, because of, of intellectual pride and so forth, is getting away from divine healing. Get away from the Holy Spirit. God still hears the cry of His people. Amen. Somebody's got to go. Jack of all, let's rise and shine in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. If you're sick, you say, I'm sick in body. God has spoken. God said so. Yes. These signs shall follow them as leaves, and my name is shall lay hands on the sick. Hallelujah. They shall recover. Yes. God has spoken. Have an ambition. Well, the doctor said I was going to die. That's the best the doctor knows. He studied. Every medical research shows that he's done all he can do for you. So it's according to medical science, you're going to die. But the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Rise your ambition. Have a purpose that you're going to be healed for the glory of God. Then come with a faith that I'm going to receive it. You'll get it. Yes, sir. You say, Brother Ben, I can't understand it. Well, now, when I go, when I go overseas, now I go up here, here's a big ship sitting there, a big airship, seven times around. I, I flew this uh, thing around. I don't go up and say, hey, pilot, uh, before I get on this ship, you tell me how much stroke them, uh, each one of those props has. Give me all the mechanics of how this plane will operate. In the time of a storm, what will it do? How much power do you have? How high can you climb? All the mechanics. I don't ask all those things. I know the ship went across with us, someone else. If the ship went across with someone else, it'll go across with me. So I just climb aboard and get me a seat and sit down. It's up to the pilot to see that I get there. Oh, amen. That's way on divine healing. I don't know all the mechanics about it. I can't tell you the mechanics. Nobody else can. How a man can die here and be strapped across his back or feed God so much till he heal the sick because he believes it. I can't explain that. I don't know the mechanics. I just take the hold of promise and accept it and say, Lord, it's so. Amen. You believe that, don't you? Sure. Just accept it on the basis that God said so. That's the man we're building a platform for. Remark now before closing. I might say this. What about when you submit yourself to the doctor? When the doctor comes and he says he has some medicine for you. And you take the medicine and you say, now doctor, sit down here and tell me what's all in this pill. Uh, what, what's the mechanics of it? <laughs> what's all the analysis of this pill? What, what, what kind of a medical formula have you got mixed up here for me? Uh, how did you get this strychnine? How, did it, how was that? What did it come from? Who found it? And uh, where did this glycerine come from? And where did this, all these other stuff that goes into the farmer? He writes it in Greek. Probably he don't even know it himself. He just writes it out. All right, that's what he's been told to do. But the only thing you do, you submit yourself to the doctor and take the pill. That's all. And if you trust your doctor, chances are it'll help you. That's the same thing about taking this goss pill. I can't tell you all about it, but I know it works. I see you take others. 
When it comes to time to die, how you going to be translated and go over into another world and become a new creature over there and, and never get old, turn back to a young man again? How you going to do it? I don't know. I just submit myself to my pilot that the day is of my going. He'll see that I get over there, all right? He'll see about the rest of it. My shoulders will straighten back and I'll become a young man and, and uh, I'll be different then. Because all the symbols of death will be taken from this old body, and I'll be may have a body like his own glorious body, for I shall see him as he is. I don't say, Lord, tell me how you do it. I don't care how you do it. Just so I got it. That's the main thing, and he promised it, and I believe it. Amen. He promises a revival. He promises these signs shall follow them that believe. The fair face shall save the sick. I don't know the mechanics of it. All I know, he promised it, and it's true. I've seen others step on it and go across. Then I can step on it too and go across. And you can step on it and go across. Amen. What if a doctor comes and says, you got an appendix i got to take out. Or i got to take a, a blood clot off the brain. Well, doctor, tell me just what, how many nerves, what do you have to cut, how you cut this, how you don't do that. You just, you're sick and you want to get well. So you just submit yourself to the doctor and he goes on and does the work. That's all there is to it. That's the same way by Jesus Christ. Oh, my. I hope tonight that he performs a great operation on all of our faith. Don't you hope so? Yeah. Takes all the ruptured appendix out and all the, all of the other things, the little scavengers that's hanging around over us, the barnacles that come on through disappointments and things like Just let God operate on our faith and take all of it out. Take everything away. And when we wake up to the fact to know that Jesus is the same yesterday and forever, we'll have a perfect faith to work on through this coming week. Do you believe that, church of God? Do you believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Amen. Are you willing to trust your case right into his hand? Amen. Will you do it? Will you do everything that you can now upon this platform of the man I'm trying to speak about? Is your Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you trust yourself? Will you, will you vote for him right now? Will you elect him your Savior, your healer right now in your heart and say, Lord God, I'm going to believe every word of it. I'm going to work with all that's in me and everything goes on. If I see something going on in the meeting this week that I don't understand, I'll go right home and see if it's in the formula. I'll go right home and see if it's in the Bible and see if God promised it. If he promised it, it's your, it's your privilege to believe it. Yeah. It's for you. It's, it's the farmer that God gives you. Hallelujah. The other night I was preaching on the subject of why. And why, why? And I told him the Bible had a formula. In this formula there was in there the cure for sin and sickness. Would you like to look at Moses? Well, he had Moses' the satchel. He ministered to two million Israelites. And he kept them there for 40 years. And when they come out, there wasn't a feeble one among them. If there would be a doctor here, wouldn't you like to see what prescription Moses had? How many babies is born every night? See, what prescription did Moses give? He didn't have no blood transfusions and things out there for these bad cases and, and uh, have to have uh, cesarean operations and so forth. What was his farmer that he had? You don't know what it is? It's written right here in Genesis. Or Exodus, rather. It's written here. I'm the Lord thy God that heals all thy diseases. <laughs> that was the farmer. That's the man we want to elect in this for our campaign. All that wants to elect him in your heart, for to vote him in, as to be your risen Lord, your risen healer, your risen God, that died for you and rose again on the third day and is alive. Will you elect him and say, Lord, come into this building in each night. Come into my heart. Give me faith and courage. Give me an ambition. Do something for me. I want to be blessed by your power. Raise up your hands if you'll take him like that. Say, everywhere, wherever you are. The Lord bless you. Now, tomorrow night, the Lord willing, will be here to give out the prayer cards at 6.30. And then we'll start the prayer line around about 8.30, about 9.30, I guess, or 9 o'clock. And by 9.30, we'll be out. I, I thought tonight I'd say these things, build a little platform, let you know what we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ and every promise that he made. We believe that the New Testament is, a, is an antitype of the old, that it just takes from the old. The old foreshadows the new, and the things that God did in both is sure today in the form of the Holy Spirit, the same pillar of fire, the same God, the same healing, the same blessings, the same saving power, everything that he was, he is today and will be forever. 
And we do not believe that these things lay in man. We believe that man has gifts, but God has already purchased our salvation, our healing at Calvary. And I want you to elect him in your heart tonight to say, God, send your power, send your blessing. I'll believe it and accept it as my own personal property from you. It's a promise that you give me. May the Lord bless you. Now, I want you to lay your hands over on one another now. Around through the building, wherever you are. Now, if there be someone here who's sick and afflicted, the Bible has said this, these signs shall follow them that believe. The Bible never said these signs just shall follow Brother Bram, Brother Roberts, or your pastor, or somebody else's pastor. These signs shall follow them, plural. Are you a believer? Say amen. amen. Then them signs shall follow you. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Do you believe that? Then when I pray here for all of you, each one of you, don't pray for yourself now. Pray for the person you got your hands on. See? Say, Lord, give to this person I got my hand on. Give to them the desire of their heart. Say that. Say, give them. If they're sick, give them healing. If you know the person, say, heal this person. And God's power will heal each one of you. And tomorrow night you'll be back here saying, Brother Brown, before anything ever happens, before I ever see any great working of the Holy Spirit, I've already witnessed it in my life that He healed me last night. Right when we were trying to elect Him, I accepted Him into my heart and something taking place. I just, I just, He operated on me last night. And all my doubts are buried in the fountain and now I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. While we bow our heads. There's a sinner here. Remember your Creator now. While it is time that you can, for the hour will soon come, or you'll not be permitted this. One backslidden, make your way back to God tonight. Won't you do it? Then go early in the morning to the church and say, Pastor, I'll return now. I won't take up my fellowship. If you're a sinner, make your way down to the church and rejoice and say, Baptize me, Pastor. I want to become a member of the church. I want to serve God from you. And then tomorrow night, go get you four or five more sinners and bring them back. Watch and see if the Holy Spirit doesn't move into the audience. Produce Jesus Christ just the same as he was yesterday and today. Our Heavenly Father, upon the basis of thy word, upon the basis of thy shed blood, on thy vicarious suffering at Calvary, thy triumph over death, over hell and the grave and over Satan, all the works of Satan, from sin to its all its attributes, to sickness and to disappointments and nervous frustrations and all the gloomy wearies that goes with it, all the doubts and things, we built a platform here tonight for your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. We are electing Him, Lord, for this campaign. And we're happy, Lord. There's no other one we want. We want no one but Jesus. We love Him. We believe Him with all of our heart. We believe in Him as our Savior, no other Savior. There's no church, no creed, no denomination, no pastor, no pope, no priest, no rabbi. There's nothing can save us outside the blood of your Son, Jesus. He's our Savior. We love Him. And we know that divine healing is yours. It belongs to you. While we read in Psalms 103.3, I'm the Lord who heals all your diseases. Therefore, Lord, we commit our case to you. You are our physician, our great physician. You're here tonight. Your grieving children is obeying your word by putting your hands on one another. Here's from the minister all the way to the, the laity in the church. Everyone, pastors, evangelists. All with their hands on one another, the housewives, the children, all with their hands on one another because they believe this one that we are electing, Ooh. our Lord, our healer. Now, Satan, you know this. You're aware. And you're nothing but a bluff anyhow. And we're calling your hands. Our Lord's elected in our heart as healer, as savior, as king, as ruler. Lord, ownership, rulership. Now you have to get out, Satan. You might as well get ready to go because you have to. God's work must be fulfilled. So I charge thee by the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who is vicarious sufferings and victory, who robs you of 
Luther stripped you of every legal right you had. You have four legal rights. You are a defeated being. And we charge thee through Jesus Christ, come out of this people, see them, as they have their hands on one another, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of them, I loose them, for the glory of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Your head bowed now. Feel his goodness moving in. Believe it, no matter how funny it seems, we don't go by. How funny it seems. We go by how real it is. It's God's Word. It's kind of funny for Noah to say it's going to rain, but it, it rains. It's kind of funny for Abraham looking for a city and saying he's going to have a baby when he's 100 years old, but Sarah, who was 90, but he had it. Funny for Moses to say he's going down to Egypt to take over, but he did it. God said so. It's kind of strange for the Hebrew children to say, Our God's able to deliver us this body furnace, and he did it. Daniel come out of the lions then alive after being there vicious lions hungry all night but he did it John to come out of bat of, bat of oil after being burned for 24 hours but he did it Lazarus come out of the grave after being dead four days but he did it Jesus rose on the third day after being crucified body and bomb by a Roman spear the witness of the earth said he's dead God said he's dead nature said he's dead the earth said he's dead the Romans said he's dead everything said he was dead and he lived again forevermore I feel the earth but he's dead God heals you now his promise says he does so you have a right to it do you accept it do you accept your healing I don't care how crippled you are how blind you are how dead whatever strong with you I don't care will you stand to your feet right now and say I accept my healing upon the basis of God's word stand to your feet if you believe it amen amen that's good wonderful oh good now now you that wasn't sick and you want to accept him as Lord in your heart believe the platform want to elect Jesus to be the ruler of this campaign, to be the healer in this campaign, to be Lord in this campaign. The rest of you stand on your feet. That'll do that. Say, I accept it to be my Lord, my healer, my all, my Savior, and all in this campaign. Wonderful. Everybody to their feet. That's fine. Oh, I believe I hear the sound of one of three. I believe uh, there's going to be something happening here. How many feel that believe that? Amen. I believe with all my heart. Now let's pray to you.